Welcome to the 2012-2013 Lectures in Catholic Experience. My name is Christina Vanine. I'm an associate professor here in the Department of Religious Studies. I'm the director of the Master of Catholic Thought program and I'm coordinating the lecture series for this year and for the next couple of years. Before we get started, would you please turn off any possible kind of electronic device that you might be carrying somewhere on your person or in a bag or somewhere. So we'll at least get everybody else's equipment turned off and just keep ours on, please and thank you. Next Thursday, October the 11th, 2012, we will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the opening of Vatican II. When he called this ecumenical council, Blessed John the 23rd had two major goals in mind his desire for Christian unity, and his hope for a journamento, a renewal or a bringing up to date of this Catholic Church. It was a time of opening up the windows of the church, of letting in some fresh air, in a spirit of willingness to engage with the modern world. We were invited at the time to read the signs of those times and to be in solidarity with the whole of humanity, especially those who are poor or afflicted. And so in this year's lectures, we will be envisioning the next 50 years and considering the signs of our own time. And so we are pleased to have Dr. Daniel Grudy with us this evening to invite us to consider the plight of, Im of migrants in our world. And it's especially appropriate that Dr. Grudy is here presenting this year's Teresa Dees lecture. Ellen Dees was born in the county Kildare, Ireland on May 4th, 1820. In 1845, she joined the Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary, whom we know better as the Loretto Sisters. She joined a house that they had established in Rathfarnham outside of Dublin. She was given the religious name Teresa, and she prepared herself for a life of teaching. When Bishop Michael Power from Toronto visited that abbey in 1847, it was during the worst year of the Great Irish Famine. His hope was to recruit some Loretto sisters to his diocese to lay the foundations for a network of Catholic schools. Mother Teresa Deese was among the group of four sisters and novice who were sent to found a mission in Canada. She eventually became the superior of the Loretto sisters in North America, and she held that position for 38 years. According to Mark McGowan, her leadership was marked by a gentleness, a propriety, and a gentility that betrayed the courage, fortitude, and creativity that became hallmarks of the Loretto sisters. Mother Teresa D. succeeded in recruiting young Canadian women to join the Loretto community, and they developed an impressive reputation for excellence in teaching. They expanded Catholic schools across this province into Brantford, London, Guelph, Niagara Falls, Hamilton, Lindsay, Stratford. The Loretto sisters built schools and they donated their salaries back to those schools. They helped to develop curriculum. They ran large educational establishments with the highest standards of professionalism. And so we continue to look back to Mother Teresa Dees as one of the great pioneers and shepherds of Ontario's Catholic schools. And it is in these schools that we invite our students and our staff to engage with the serious issues of justice in our own day. The experience of migrants is such an issue. Daniel Grudy is an associate professor of theology at the University of Notre Dame and a member of the Holy Cross religious community. His academic focus and his work as director of the Center for Latino Spirituality and Culture grew out of his ministry with migrants on the U.S.-Mexican border. Through this work, he has learned that migration, quote, is not just a socio-political issue, but it is something that's deeply theological and spiritual that names what it means to be human. He has also learned that the most difficult and painful part of the journey of the migrant is the behavior of others towards them. Dr. Grudy argues that we need to speak about this inhumane dimension and we need to speak about it in our churches as well so that we can reach the core of the issue and learn how our thinking and our acting about migrant people needs to change. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel Grudy to speak to us this evening on a pilgrim people 
a human journey, theological perspectives on migration and Eucharist. Dr. Grudy. Thanks, Christine, and thank you for coming tonight. It's, uh, it's nice to be back here. Nice to be back here in this area. I think our microphone actually is, the portable one's no longer working here. So this happened yesterday too. I, it probably is good to just maybe begin with a story about a priest one time when he got up on Sunday and uh, he was about to pr proclaim the gospel and he looked out at everybody and he stretched his hands out and he says, the Lord be, and something wasn't working right. So he just worked at the dials a little bit and then got up again second time, a little more flustered. And then he goes, the Lord be, Still nothing. So he went to see if things were plugged in correctly. And then the third time he said, the Lord be, and he said, there's something wrong with the microphone. And people said, and also with you. <laughs> so, so for sure that microphone's dead. So, so today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about migration. I'd like to share with you some stories. I'd like to tell you uh, just some of the reflection we've been doing on this subject and, and to just uh, to try to give a new imagination about how we think about migration today. This is actually a, a big issue, certainly in the United States. I know it is here in Canada. It's also a very big issue in Europe, uh, certainly many, many parts of the world. This is something that people are dealing with. Uh, but it's not a new issue. And it's something that's been going on for many, many years. And so I'd like to just begin really with telling two stories uh, that uh, one that really kind of launched me into this issue. I mean, I've been, I was asked earlier tonight how I got into the issue of migration. And, and I said, I really don't know. I mean, I think the gist of it is, is I, I really just fell in love with the people that I was working with. And somehow that led me deeper and deeper into the issue. But one very important experience for me, a very much foundational experience, a, a watershed experience, I would say, happened when I was first assigned to my uh, initial parish. And so I was recently ordained. Uh, I was as green as could be. Uh, I was still learning the ropes. I, I really didn't know a lot of the different aspects of uh, working in parish ministry, especially kind of launched from uh, my MDiv program. And so I can remember I was in this Hispanic parish and it just so happened that the other members of the, my community that uh, normally were in that parish were gone at that point and so I was the only one there. And the phone rang at five o'clock in the morning. And so when the phone rang, a guy said, oh my gosh, it's an emergency, it's an emergency room call. And so I kind of got up in a fright and answered the phone. And on the other end of the line was this woman named Margarita Rubalcaba. Now, Margarita Rubalcaba was the oldest daughter of 14 children. And they had just migrated from Mexico to the United States. And she was in a panic, and so the conversation went something like this, Daniel, Daniel. I said, Margarita, what? And so she said, I can't get my car started. So I said, oh gosh, what happened, Margarita? She says, oh, I don't know, I connected the two cables and the cables melted. And so she went on to tell me that if she didn't get to work, she was gonna lose her job. So I said, gosh, Margarita, I don't really know anything about cars, but if you want, I'll, I'll, I'll be right down. And so she says, wait, 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 one more thing, hold on. She says, my sister Christina wants to talk with you. Christina was 17 years old and she was nine months pregnant. And she says, I'm going into labor. <laughs> so suddenly I was wide awake and I uh, kind of rushed down to the house. And then when I got there, the mother of the 14 looked at me and then she looked at her daughter, Christina. And then she said, Christina, look, just keep walking back and forth and these labor pains may go away. So I thought, you know, she's done this 14 times, you know, she's got a pretty good idea about what this is about. So I said, you know, look, I'll, I'll take Margarita to work and then come back. So I took Margarita to work and it came back and then she looks at me and she goes, nope, she's ready to go. She says, you got to take her to the hospital because I got to take care of the kids. So it was one of these things that just kind of my mind just kind of went into slow motion. And, and I started just thinking back in my past and trying to look for some connection to this experience and then I thought, now, where in the seminary did they teach you what you're supposed to do in a time like this? <laughs> so coming up empty, I started to sweat and I, you know, kind of got Margarita out to the car and then I put her in the car and closed the door and then she looks at me, she goes, three minutes, three minutes. I said, Margarita, three minutes what? And she says, the contractions are three minutes apart. So I said, oh my gosh, this kid's going to pop out right here in the car. Uh, we're going to have an amniotic sac and fluid and all over the place. It's going to be a natal chaos. And so I gunned it to the hospital. 
and you know got her all set up and and then got her situated in the bed and then I had seen this somewhere on a television show so I said to her I said Margaret I said uh, Christina I said just breathe deeply just breathe deeply so Christina starts breathing deeply and I said Christina take my hand and Christina took my hand and then sometime later the nurse came by and she goes who are you and I thought saying father at a time like that may not be the best thing to say, so I said, uh, um, I am just a good friend here helping out. And um, so I'm there for an hour, two hours, maybe three hours, and then I, I looked down and I said, gosh, Christina, I said, you know, no offense, but how long does this usually take? I said, I've got to do my first funeral homily tomorrow of a suicide of a 13-year-old, and I really don't know what to say. I said, so if we're going to be here for a while, I've got to do a little work, all right? So I said, so to hold my hand, so she held my hand, and I called up on the other line a friend of mine who had done a suicide funeral the year before, and I said, Dan, what, what do I do in this case? So he sp starts talking to me 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but he had no idea where I was. So 15 minutes later, Christina just erupts into the background, and she starts screaming, and he goes, um, what's going on over there? And I thought, actually, it's just another day at an immigrant Hispanic parish, and I'm just helping give birth to this child here. <laughs> well, sometime later, this child was born. And this child's name was Krista, literally a little Christ, you know. And the situation was there was the hope for life on the one hand and there was the experience of death on the other. And it's out of that that this child was born. And so what I'd like to reflect with you on tonight is how do we think about God in Christ being born amidst a very difficult birth process? And we can think about migration as a birth process because it's something that's been going on for many, many years. It's not new, um, but it, what is interesting that in, in Spanish, the word, when a woman gives birth, she actually gives loose, she gives light. That, um, se da luz, she gives light. And so, how do we look for light amidst this very controversial, complex, difficult reality of migration? But as I said, it's not something new. Uh, and in fact, I was reminded of this a number of years ago. This is a true story. Right, that I'm told that the, with the Irish, they said, you know, don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. But this actually is a true story. And it happened with a, an Irishman. My godfather was an Irishman. He kept alive the Irish heritage that I come from. And he lived in northeast Pennsylvania. And he was my godfather. And we had received word about six years ago that he had passed away. So everyone near and far came from wherever they were. And they went back to his hometown and we paid our last respects. We had a funeral mass for him. We laid his body into the ground and we said goodbye to Bill Grudy. And after we said goodbye to Bill Grudy, I went home and I opened my email for the first time since the funeral. And I was very struck by one email because on the message line, it just said a note from Bill Grudy. And I thought, wow. He made it, you know. Um, he's wireless now, and um, he just wanted to let us know that he was okay. And um, But this guy said, my name is Bill Grudy, and I live out on the West Coast, and I live uh, out near Napa Valley. And my wife went away for the weekend, and so I typed in Grudy into Google to see what was out there. And he says, I came across some of the things you're doing. And he says, you know, if you're ever out this way, he says, I'd love to touch base. And he says, you know, I'm coming out for a couple weeks. I says, in, in a couple weeks. He says, my community has a house in the Bay Area. I'll be staying there for a couple days. He says, why don't you join us for dinner? So you can imagine this in any family or community setting. I flew in late in the afternoon and my community members knew I was coming and so they said, you know, when I got there, they said, will you be here for dinner? And I said, yes, you know, and I met somebody on the internet and I invited him over for dinner as well. <laughs> well, they turned white. They're like, wait a minute, you don't even know this guy, Bill Grudy, and you just simply invited him over for dinner? I said, yeah, no problem, you know, don't worry about it. Well, Bill came, people were a little guarded. You know, they weren't sure if he was a mass murderer in Bill Grudy disguise or not. But, you know, Bill and I began talking and then, you know, we began connecting the dots. And he says, you know, I said, Bill, what have you been doing all these years? He says, you know, I used to live out on the East Coast and I was an NBC News reporter for NBC News Radio. And I said, oh my gosh, Bill, we used to hear you on the radio and we always wondered whether we were connected. He says, you know, now I'm out on the West Coast and I've begun to do video productions. I said, oh, well, that's interesting, Bill, because I've been starting to do some video productions too. And, you know, we started talking and we started comparing notes. And he says, look, we, we've got to sort of figure this out. So we brought him back to the East Coast, got my eldest relative 
relatives together, and we compared notes to the best of our abilities. And we found out that we were connected through two brothers who came over from Ireland through Canada into the United States 200 years ago. These were very, very shrewd businessmen as well. They once owned the whole area up in midtown Manhattan, right by Lincoln Center. And then they said, nothing's ever going to develop along this area, so they just sold it. <laughs> but something happened to the family. Like one married outside the clan. We're not really sure what happened, but whatever caused a major rift. And one brother was so angry that he says, how can I make the other brother as angry as possible? He says, I know what I'll do. He says, I'll become a Protestant. So. His family went with the Protestant line, and my family went with the Catholic line, and it took 200 years to get the family back together again. So, they was told later that Irish Alzheimer's is that you forget everything but your grudges. <laughs> so, so, Bill and I began working on a number of projects together, including a number of films, but uh, it was like finding a long lost brother. He's a great, great friend, a beautiful person. But we also participated in something about a, uh, a year ago, and this is something you can do as well. And National Geographic and IBM have teamed up, and you can actually take a sample from the inside of your cheeks. And by looking at uh, certain genetic variants with the DNA strand and looking at them in comparison to indigenous tribes that are localized in the area, you can trace back your migration heritage 80,000 years. And so this is actually the journey. When Bill and I did it, it was an exact genetic match. And so what's fascinating here is that this is the journey that Bill Grudy's and my ancestors have traveled for the last 80,000 years. This is the paternal lineage. And so it's believed that, you know, humanity started somewhere here in the, the Olduvai Gorge. Uh, and we we're literally, you know, Meryl Streep was right. It was out of Africa that we came. And so the, it emerged out of this area here, came up into Asia, and then arced back into what is northern Italy, southern Spain, and then central England. And so 90% of the men in that area have share similar genetic characteristics as Bill Grudy and myself. And so this is the deep story, you know, and it's from there that the, that the more proximate migration from probably England to Ireland and then Ireland to the United States would have happened. But my point is, is that migration is literally in the genes. Um, it's something that's so much a for part of the fabric of our lives that it's uh, really a constitutive part of who we are. In fact, there was a historian a number of years ago who set out to write a history of migration in the United States. And then he realized that the history of the United States is really about migration. Right? And I think in many ways that's the same way here. This is one of the most diverse populations anywhere in the world. And so we're dealing with migration all the time. But migration is in our genes. But it's in our spiritual genes as well. And that's why, as we look at the scriptures, that it's fascinating to see how migration is so interwoven into the fabric of what it means to be a, 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 a child of God. And so, you know, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are a bit of a prehistory. We don't quite know where these areas are, whether the literal or figurative or whatever else. But when we get to the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis, uh, we see very identifiable historical markers. And so the first part of Genesis is creation of the big picture of the world, the universe, and human beings. But when we get to the 12th chapter, it's about creation of the people of God. And so it's interesting that once that narrative begins, it begins on a migration story. Leave your country. Go to the land that I will show you, and you will be a blessing. You know, that, that really we see about a God migrating uh, to Abraham and, and calling Abraham himself to migrate in return. So we see this in Abraham, in covenant, in exodus, in exile, in return. We see this in incarnation. We see this in death and resurrection. We see this in mission. We see this also in the very end of the scriptures when John from exile, in exile, in Patmos, writes about the vision of the New Jerusalem. So the bookends of the scripture really are, have a migration interwoven into them. And so much so that Vatican II says that the identity of who we are as a people of God is that of being a pilgrim people. Is that we're never fully at home here. Uh, we're never fully at a resting place. We're really sojourning through this life. And so migration really and spirituality are so interconnected um, that they name who we are. And so what, um, if they were migrating today, these are the areas where Abraham would have had to move through. But even in his own day, there were political borders and there were boundaries. And to cross those boundaries sometimes could be considered a hostile act. And so part of this too is how we think about borders and boundaries and barriers. And the ways in which this kind of figures into God's call to us and our response. 
Now this was a picture I took a couple years ago. This was in Qumran. This was along the Dead Sea, sh the shore of the Dead Sea, right outside of Jerusalem, on the other side of Jerusalem. And here is a Bedouin farmer. So this is one of the long legacies. This is one of the long descendants of, of Abraham. This is one of the desert shepherds here who is doing the same work that Abraham would have done in his day. And here he is hosting a tourist, presumably from Asia, and he's talking on his cell phone. So, but I don't know about you, when I saw this, it was just sort of one of the things I'm like, yeah, okay, that's kind of where we're at, isn't it? I mean, we don't know whether this is progress or this is regress. I mean, we don't know what we're gaining or what we're losing, whether we're moving forward, whether we're moving back backwards. This whole kind of confluence of globalization and migration really kind of throws into a mix and things are changing faster than they never changed before. So there's many ways in which this topic is looked at, but what my kind of particular angle on this is to ask the question is, how do we think about migration theologically? And there's a lot of different ways in which you know, this can be done, but I want to point out three different ways. The first level is really the pastoral level, and that is how those with resources or those in the church move out to those who are vulnerable and help through direct advocacy, or direct aid, through legislative advocacy, through material need. And so this is commonly the way we think about the church being involved in the migration issue. And it's an important level. Most of the documents of the church are written from this perspective. And it's, so it's a fundamental issue of, of just you know, reaching out to those who, who really are struggling. But it's not the only level of a theology of migration because there's also another level which is really much more of a listening posture. It's, it's really much more of the spiritual level and it's trying to map out a bit more of what the internal journey is like for migrants. What do they think and what do they feel? What do they struggle with? What do they hope for? What brings healing? What brings empowerment? How would they speak to God? How would they speak tonight if they were here? And so it's really understanding the inner process and the inner migration, the inner journey. And, and so it's a very, very important part of, I think, this area of, of theology migration. And this is the area where I've been kind of uh, doing a lot of my research, um, mostly along the U.S.-Mexican border. And, and so, but increasingly along the borders of uh, Syria, um, Malta, Libya, Morocco, Spain, Ukraine, Slovakia, Egypt, Eritrea, um, and um, coming up, uh, tomorrow we'll be going into the Syrian refugee camps. And so part of it is to really look at uh, what the church is doing, but also how the refugees are responding. Right? And so it's very important, I think, to understand this. It's very much neglected in other disciplines, but it's important in this area. But the third is the theological level, and that's really to see how migration names what it means to be human before God. And so how do we think about migration from a theological perspective and how does it really name what it means to be human in this world? Okay. So those are kind of some of the things that I want to look at. But uh, what I want to do tonight is really just look at four areas. And I want to frame the, the kind of conversation about migration uh, in, light of the, in light of the Eucharist. And so we know that in the, the Eucharist there are two central... In the Catholic Eucharist, there's two central kind of parts. There's the liturgy of the Word, and there's the liturgy of the Eucharist. It's preceded by the entrance rite, and it's followed in the end by the concluding rite. And so those are the four parts, really, of my talk tonight. And the first is really going to deal with the entrance rite. And it's to really eat, uh, look out, the, the kind of mapping out the sort of ground floor, the entrance rite, the, the foundational territory. So each part of the talk tonight is going to go a little bit deeper. Uh, we start off kind of at the service level, then we're going to go into the way people think about it. We're going to move into the area the human heart, and then finally we're going to move out kind of into the area of uh, transformation and mission. And so this first area in the, in the foundational territory is going to just look at numbers and statistics and try to get a global picture about migration. But the second part is to go a little deeper into the liturgy of the words, which is really the debated territory, right? So whether we look at this historically, whether we look at this today, not just in Canada or the United States, but also internationally. Um, there's different opinions about this and a lot of different reactions. And so what I want to do is look at the social landscape, the political landscape, and the legal landscape, right? and the different ways people look at this. And particularly, some of the positive values that each group is fighting for you know, in this controversial debate and why they're fighting for it. The third is to go into the liturgy of the Eucharist, which is the theological territory, looked at as a ministry of reconciliation. So obviously a, a big undercurrent of this, this uh, conversation is really the work of justice. And justice from a theological perspective is not about a blindfolded woman with scales in her hands or it's not about bringing people to court. You know, That fundamentally justice, theologically speaking, is about building right relationships, 
um, finding right relationships with ourselves, with God, with others, with the environment. Uh, the, the, the task of just, justice and the message of the gospel is about right relationships. So there's going to be a two-way street that we'll look at here, which is to look back into the tradition to see how does the tradition give us insight into the issue of migration and the themes that are there, but also look at the contemporary experience and see how these two speak to one another. So we'll look at traditionally what's th thought of as the Imago Dei, which is crossing over in this ministry of reconciliation, the inhuman human divide, the Verbum Dei, which is crossing over the divine human divide, the Missio Dei, crossing over the human human divide, and finally the Visio Dei, which is crossing over the country kingdom divide. And then finally, I want to talk about something in which Carl Rahner spoke of, uh, which is the liturgy of the world. So in the end, uh, that we're, we're called into mission, but it's not just to go to church to find God. It's to actually, we don't go to church to find God. Um, we go to church to be strengthened so that we can allow our eyes to be open so we can celebrate God, what God is doing all the time. You know, and so hopefully that will happen in the church, but it's really meant to also happen outside the church building as well. That God is at work in creation in our lives all the time. And that the main, the main task is to be transformed in such a degree that we see God's activity at work in all of creation and in all of our lives. And particularly as it deals with building those right relationships. And so really when we look at this fractured and divided reality of migration, we want to see ways in which we can create connections, especially where there's fractures and divisions. All right, so, so that's really uh, where we want to go today. So as we go uh, really into the first part, the entrance right, it's, it's to first understand what we mean by migration. Right? There's many different terms that are used. And these are not just terms that scholars come up with in their spare time in order to stay gainfully employed. Uh, it's actually they're terms that are used that have very real ramifications to them in terms of what kind of protections people have. So who is the migrant? The first is the economic migrant, and this is the person who moves between countries in search of a more dignified life through work, which promises a better future. So if you were to go to the borders of the U.S. and Mexico, if you were to go to the borders of Ukraine and Slovakia, if you were to go there between Morocco and Spain, and ask the people, most of the people crossing the borders, why are you coming? That inevitably, most of them, probably 98% of them would say, I'm going because my family has needs. We don't have enough for medicine or food or clothing or shelter. We don't have enough to make ends meet. So one of us has to come north to work so that they can send money back home to help our families. And so what's the economic migrant um, is however, does not have a legal right to cross borders without papers, according to the political perspective. Catholic social teaching really sees this very differently. The first is that they have a right to stay in their homelands, but if they don't have enough for a dignified life, they do have a right to move, and they have a right to move even across borders without documents. But from a political perspective, uh, nation states do not see that they have a right to cross borders. Now, forced migrants are refugees, however, are those who flee a country because of what is technically defined as a well-founded fear of persecution because of race, religion, nationality, social membership, or political opinion. So if you cross the border and you say refugee, you're processed very differently than an economic migrant. There's moderate progress after World War II when there were not sort of such accords, that this came out of World War II, United Nations in the late 40s and early 50s recognized that it was a moral failure that people fleeing Nazi concentration camps and other places were sent back to their home countries and subsequently tortured or, or, or killed. And so they said if a person can prove that by being sent back to their home country that they will be tortured or killed, then they can seek asylum. And so many asylum seekers obviously are here in Canada, right? Here in this, this very area. Some of you I know are working in this area, right? So practically, technically speaking, the, the forced migrant is more vulnerable than the economic migrant. But the forced migrant has access to legal protections that the economic migrant doesn't, right? And I would say it's rarely granted. So in many cases, you know, maybe 1% are granted for those who apply. But it is a case where they are, uh, that there is a distinction. Third are internally displaced people, and these are people who have been forcibly uprooted, but they're still within the borders of their home country. So it may be places like China, where there are people moving from rural areas to urban areas, and there are more internally displaced people in China than the rest of the world combined. But it may be places like Colombia, where there's between two and five million people who are internally displaced because of wars between military groups and paramilitary groups. Right? So they're kind of like refugees, but they haven't crossed an international border. 
And lastly, probably one of the darkest kind of chapters in in the migration sort of area is the, are victims of human trafficking. And these are people who've been lured into migrating by false promises of work, and they end up being labor or sex slaves. All right, so they may not have any economic or educational opportunities on the horizon, and they be, be lured into, into this kind of slavery by someone that they know in their home country, and they'll say, we have a job for you in a tourist agency in Canada, in Toronto. And you know, just come with me and I'll show you the way. And then they find themselves locked into a situation where they may be not only physically imprisoned and forced to have sex, sometimes up to 25 times a day, but they actually may be in a psychological bondage, knowing where their families are, they, they threaten to do harm to them if they try to escape. Now this, this affects between 12 and 27 million people today. And this is the second most lucrative legal industry in the world, tied only with the legal arms industry. Major, major business. And when it comes to big sporting events and other things, the black market moves in and actually imports up to 50,000 people for the World Cup. They imported as many as 50,000 people, trafficked women and sometimes men who you know could be kind of provide sexual services to uh, sports tourists. All right. So there's a moderate, very, very incremental progress uh, on this, but it's very important to distinguish the victim of human trafficking from the economic migrant or the refugee because otherwise you end up doubly or triply criminalizing those people who are in this situation. Now in terms of the scope, as I said, this has been happening from the beginning of time, but what is different today are the sheer numbers. Right now there are more people migrating than at any other time in history. We don't know the exact numbers, but there are the estimates that about 212 million people are living away from their homeland for more than a year. That makes about one out of every 35 people on the planet, which is roughly the population of Brazil, which is the fifth largest population on the planet. So the po equivalent of Brazil is migrating as I speak. Now, what is important uh, here as well is to look at why people are migrating. It's very common that people say, oh, you know, why, do these people, why don't these people just stay home? And from our suburban locations, it's easier to see that. But when you actually look at the root causes of migration, it's important to keep a couple things in mind. When we were doing some work on globalization, I can remember, I'm a theologian by training, but I knew we had to get some grounding on reality and the social aspects of reality through social sciences. I did the best that I could on my own, but then I flew to the World Bank and met with some of the lead economists there to really make sure that the data that I had was correct and to help them strengthen and refine the data. And this was the data we finally came up with. 19% of the world lives on less than a dollar a day. 48% of the world lives on less than $2 a day. 75% of the world lives on less than $10 a day. 95% of the world lives on less than $50 a day. The top 1% of the world has as much as the poorest 57% of the world. And the three richest people in the world have as much as the poorest 48 nations. All right. Now, when we look at those numbers, you know, then, and this has begun to sort of the, the polarization has, in the last 200 years uh, has gone from really a 3 to 1 ratio to a 120 to 1 ratio. And, and so these issues, I think, are at the heart of why migration is happening. And if we don't see those, we really see migration as the problem itself rather than a symptom of other things that are precipitating it. Now what Vatican II is, says is that those disorders are related to the disorders within the human heart. That somehow the outward structuring of society is somehow connected to the inner disorders within us. And so that's why conversion is so important because it really does deal with the reordering of the human heart and the reordering of society. Now there is a lot of migration happening in other parts of the world. In fact the biggest burden sharing of migrants, people who are carrying the burden of taking, dealing with migrants who are coming to them right, right now, uh, are within the developing countries, right? So right now, um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be going tomorrow to the Syrian refugee camps. Who are those countries? Egypt, Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan, right? These countries are already overrun. They're already kind of under-resourced, um, but they're having to deal with some of the biggest kind of refugee crises already. And certainly within Africa, there's a lot of internal migration going on. Now, the most vulnerable population within the refugee categories uh, or within the migrant categories are those who are really without documents. And so right now there's about 30 to 40 million people who who don't have official documentation. There's even some places in the South Pacific 
Tuvalu and Kiribati that are sinking into the sea and within two years they will be completely unable to be inhabitable. So they will become stateless people. I mean that the, the land of their birth no longer will exist. It will be under the sea or there will no longer be act adequate drinking water there. That there are between 10 there are about uh, 10,000 people on the one island, there's 100,000 people on the other island. And we're having major, major difficulty trying to resettle those numbers. But that's only the tip of the iceberg, because literally as the icebergs melt, it could actually flood areas like Bangladesh, which are so low uh, that you could actually displace as many as 40 million people within the next 40 years. Right? So we don't have any idea what to do with those numbers. But what we do know is that the issue of migration is here to stay and that scholars have called our own times the age of migration. No matter what policies our governments enact or don't enact, this issue is going to be with us. And so part of the challenge is to know how to deal with this. 2.5 to 4 million people cross borders each year without papers. And about 5 million are in Europe. 500,000 migrate into Europe and into the United States each year. The numbers have come down somewhat in the United States for various reasons, but roughly between two and 500,000 have been coming into the United States each year. Now within the United States, no politician, right now, not in their debates, not anything, has really come up with an, an issue of what to do with the 10 to 12 million people in the United States who have no official documentation. We can talk about building bigger walls, we can talk about borders, we can talk about border patrol, but in terms of what to do with 10 to 12 million people who are undocumented, we have absolutely no idea what to do with. And it's a political hot potato and, and to sort of say suddenly you're for undocumented right migrants, you're against jobs for Americans or Canadians or somehow you're no longer American because they're sort of changing the way we do things or somehow you're soft on terrorism. Whatever it is, this is a political football. All right? But it's, uh, it's something that certainly is with us whether we deal with it or not. Now, one of the things that's been interesting uh, in, in my own research has been working with the border patrols, uh, not just in the United States, but also in, uh, in Europe. And my, ma my mother uh, comes from Slovakian heritage, and so I started working with the Slovakian Border Patrol a number of years ago, and uh, they hosted me a number of times over there, and I've hosted them over in the United States, and uh, it's been very, very interesting. But this is, this is actually from the Ukrainian side looking over into Europe and this is the beginning of Europe, beginning of Slovakia. So this is actually the beginning of what's sometimes referred to as Fortress Europe. And I would say that the problems that, that, that Europe are dealing with are more complicated even than what we're dealing with here in North America. Maybe not Toronto, because Toronto is dealing with this as well. In the United States, it's primary Latino migration, primarily who have a primarily Christian and or Catholic background, uh, who are coming into a Protestant country mostly. And so there's cultural some, some kind of uh, denominational tensions, but basically there's common ground. But in Europe, you have a lot of people who are coming from uh, Muslim families, and they're coming from African countries, and it's, uh, not, just cultu it's not just cultural, linguistic, and uh, 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 racial, but it's also uh, a very complex religious landscape. Uh, that, you know, there's negative population growth going on in Europe, and these, some of these Muslim families have six or eight kids. Um, so overnight they're building mosques in places that for 1,500 years have had only churches in their town squares. You know, so this is creating a tremendous amount of cultural upheaval. But this is where many of them will come in. Um, some of them will come in through this area. On the right you see the Slovakian or Ukrainian border. On the left you see the beginning of Europe here of Slovakia. They will come across these areas and the border patrols here will look to see if they have any signs of people uh, coming across without papers. These would be some of the vehicles that they would use. And if they're apprehended, this is where they would end up, here in the detention centers. All right, now, if they have refugee status, they can be subsequently deported. Uh, excuse me, if they have refugee status, they can move forward into the European Union. But if not, they can be sent back to their homelands. Right, so, you know, I could be, you know, being in some of these places too, you can imagine what it was like to meet some people who were coming out of Iraq. And you see how the direct interventionist policies within that country really force people, you know, uh, into great upheaval and to coming into places like this. So tremendous vulnerability, tremendously big numbers. Um, it is an age of migration. Um, the entrance rate right, more than anything else is to see that this issue is here to stay and whether or not we deal with it or not, it will deal with us. And, and I think so how do we become best equipped to deal with it? Well, the second part here is to go a little deeper again and to go into the really how people think about it. And I want to say two things in this section. The first is that migration is an incredibly, incredibly, incredibly complex issue. If people don't realize that, 
they aren't listening or they don't understand. Secondly, I'd like to say migra migration is an incredibly, incredibly simple issue. If people don't realize that, they aren't listening or they don't understand. And both of those are true at the same time. And, and one of the things is we have to get out of the binary logic of, of citizen, alien, you know, native, stranger, you know, legal, illegal, because those binary categories don't work. So what's my hope in tonight that you would leave with? Not just that you'd have more information, but that you would have something of a new imagination about how to think about migration. Because what we need more than anything else is a new imagination. Our operative imagination is not working. Our politics are not working. We're not in touch with reality and it's not helping us or the migrants. And so to look a little bit more at the, the imagination that's socially constructed uh, around us, but also to see how theology can give us maybe a new way of stitching that narrative. And so I just wanted to show you that for me there's been a lot of change changing and reorienting as well as going on in this process. So let me just, just share with you a story that happened to me a number of years when I was working with the Border Patrol in the southern part of the United States. So when I'd work with the Border Patrol, sometimes I'd go out with them on their helicopters, sometimes I'd go out with them on search and rescue missions, sometimes I'd go out with them what's called a ride-along. And you'd accompany an agent all day in their activities as they'd go around to different places. And so I remember one time I was with this one agent in the southern border, southern, in the Nogales sector, so we, like between here and the entrance of the room here, there was the Mexican-American wall, and we were driving along in a Ford Bronco truck. And so this agent was just sharing matter-of-factly. He says, you know, one time I was driving along here and uh, I saw this group, these were his words, this group of aliens that were coming through here. And he said, you know, I went in pursuit of them and I didn't realize that they actually were smuggling drugs. Right? So 2% involved in very serious criminal activity, 98% you know, were hardworking people looking for jobs. But this was one of the 2% where they were coming across and they had drugs. So he went after them, but then suddenly they turned around and had semi-automatic weapons and just started raining down a machine gun on, on, on top of them. And so he said, I hit the deck, and he said, I thought I was going to die at that moment. He says, I was scared out of my mind. He says, it was so traumatic that I would wake up at night, and he says, I even had to go to counseling. He says, it really, really affected my marriage, and he says, I've really never been the same since. And I, I was just, like, my eyes were open, and I thought, I never knew that. I, I never knew a Border Patrol agent had to go through all that. I mean, when I was working in parishes and people got deported, I always thought they were the bad guys, you know. But this was one where I thought, man, this, this guy really is struggling here. And, and I had to let that really register. So as so we got further along into the day, we were driving along part of the border, and so I just asked him, kind of matter-of-factly, I said, you know, how do you know which vehicles to stop? And he says, you know, they're usually weighted a certain way, and they gave me a certain number of descriptors. And, and, and so it was no more than 30 seconds. It was literally like, you know, within two minutes after I asked the question that this vehicle went by. And he suddenly goes, oh, no. And he realized that he had to go from being a Border Patrol agent on public relations duty to being a Border Patrol agent in hot pursuit of this vehicle. So he quickly turned around and went pursuit of this vehicle. And then, like, within another two minutes, I just saw this cloud of dust. And then I just saw the migrants just run in every direction. Now, I was so much in the mind of the Border Patrol agent at that moment that my first reaction was, oh, we hope he gets them. And then I stepped back and I thought about all the migrants I had worked with. And I'm like, no, I hope they get away. Run. You know? And, and that was a different kind of border to be on. And now as he was running after them, the car was still running. And in the back, they had the only thing that they had with them was a, a, a prayer book from the mass that they had been at in Mexico with pictures of their family at a baptism. And I thought, what's wrong with this picture? We're criminalizing these people who are probably just coming here to work so that they can actually go back and help their families. You know, where does the work need to be done? All right. And so I said, you know, to be intellectually honest about this, and this is something that I'd invite all of you to really do because it's hard work, but it's very important work. To be really intellectually honest about this, people who are fighting about issues of migration, regardless of their positions on it, each is trying to find some value that is important to them. And so what I want to do is kind of map out those values as I see them. And these are kind of a, a, a sort of an initial framework that have some parallels historically and vertically in terms of what's happened in the past and what's happening today in other countries. And so within them there are a lot of other groups that can be included, but I just want to map out six of them. 
The first group are the vigilante groups. And so in various forms and shapes and sizes, you see groups that are trying to protect personal property along the border, to fill in, to prevent unlawful entry, and to fill in gaps where federal enforcement fails. So in the case of the US, many of these are, are ranchers. They see people come across. They see them ruining irrigation systems, leaving a lot of trash behind. And they're saying, this is not right that there's so much civil disorder, that this is not regularized as it should be. And not only that, they're a, a nuisance and sometimes a danger. And so they're taking this into their own hands and say, as concerned citizens, we need to try to do something about it. The next group is the Department of Homeland Security, or ICE, Immigration, Customs and Enforcement. And what they're trying to do is to enforce policy. They're saying, we don't make policy, but we're trying to enforce it. We're trying to ensure order and prevent unlawful entry, especially of foreign invaders who could harm its citizens. So I worked with the Border Patrol prior to 911, and I worked with them after 911, and there was a sizable change in the way they understood what they were doing. Now, obviously the issue of terrorism has conflated this issue tremendously, and it's nothing to take lightly. When the planes hit the World Trade Center, I had four family members in the buildings. Right. Thankfully, they got out, but one of my brother priests from my religious community was in one of the planes that went in the buildings, and uh, 18 people from my home parish died. Right? Many of us, I'm sure, have some connections there. We know all of us, in some ways, are affected by this issue of, uh, of, of terrorism. But it's become so equated with immigration that it really creates a lot of additional confusion. So terrorism is something that legitimately needs to be dealt with. But when it actually is thrown into one big category of other that we're afraid of, it confuses it all the more. Especially in the United States where some of the terrorists we've had in Oklahoma were actually from the United States. So sometimes we think if we keep the foreigners out, we're going to be safe. Which doesn't go deep enough. It actually is not an adequate framework really to understand what the real issues are. The next group are political leaders, and what they're trying to do is to create federal policy, um, to protect the citizens of a country and to manage its resources. They're saying, hey, we can't let everybody in. We have to make some distinctions about who qualifies. And then we have to say, what does it mean to be an American? Right? Now, one of the exercises, that we designed an eight-week course for parishes to deal with the issue of immigration, a series of readings and videos and other things. But one of the exercises that we have them do is to go to the Canadian website and to really see if they can migrate to Canada legally. Right? Now, I know people with master's degrees who are accountants um, that really would not qualify right, to come here legally. Right? So, uh, but politicians have to make these things. Now, in the United States, the policy when my ancestors first came in was we let in just about everybody. But we make some exceptions. So if you're, if you're a, an anarchist or if you have diseases, you could be turned away at Ellis Island. And nowadays, our policy is we let in almost nobody, but we make some exceptions, right? So if, if, if you marry an American citizen, if you have specialized skill, if you have a lot of money, you, you can find a way, you know, to get in. But most people who are working on the lower end, which is the most people in the world, have no access to coming here legally. Next group are corporations. And there's, on the high end, there are corporations like Microsoft, and there are corporations, you know, uh, uh, like Intel and others that are trying to get more engineers from China and India and other places, and they're saying we can't even hire these people because they can't get legal visas. Right now, it is important to know that, that the ma some of the major kind of global companies today, Intel, Google, uh, Yahoo, Sun Microsystems, these were all started by immigrants. All right? Now, places that are a disaster in this area are places like Japan that are trying to kind of seal off their borders that they're keeping anybody from coming in. When they do that, they actually cut off a lot of initiative as well. Right? But the corporations are concerned on the upper level to bring in more migrants, but also on the lower level. You have a better program than we do. You do have a guest worker program that allows people to come in on temporary status. But there are places in California, in Colorado, in Oregon, in Texas, in, in Alabama, in North Carolina, they're literally going to waste because there are not enough people to help uh, really do a lot of the agricultural work and other construction work that's needed. So on both ends, there is a lot of discussion and, and debate and certainly political sort of vitriol going on and trying to sort of open up the doors more on this issue of migration. 
church leaders also, uh, I think principally, I think certainly in the United States, have been very consistent on this issue. If you go to the National Shrine in Washington, D.C., you can see that all the side chapels are dedicated to one immigrant group that came to the United States. So it's really it's emblematic of the church in America. The church is an immigrant church. But really what they're trying to do is, I think, uh, is to proclaim a God of life to protect the rights of human beings who are made in God's image and likeness. And as Pope Paul VI said, the mission of the church is to build a civilization of love. So it's to denounce injustice and it's to announce the reign of God. And lastly, our human rights advocates. And so with different sources of inspiration, they're also trying to protect the rights of migrants, to prevent the exploitation of the vulnerable, and to fight for human dignity. Okay, so these are different sort of positions, principally that people fight around or with, sometimes in different ways, but I think this kind of gives an initial sketch of understanding uh, some contours of the debate. Now, I'm going to grid this a couple different ways, and one of the things is to really look at the reason why it's so controversial is because often there are underneath these kind of positions different rights that people are fighting for. This group here is fighting for property rights often. This group here is really looking at sovereign rights and the rights of a nation to control its borders. Catholic social teaching recognizes that right as well. There is a right of a nation to protect its borders. However, only after the needs of distributive justice have been met. All right, But there is a right of a nation to protect its borders. Thirdly are cultural rights, and that is the question of what does it mean to be an American or Canadian? What does it mean to be from Toronto? Well, there are major questions. What does it mean to adopt somebody from Ecuador and be an American or be a Canadian? I mean, these are these are these are really challenging issues. I think that 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 we all have to struggle with. This group is looking at economic rights. This group is looking at national natural rights, those given by God. And then this group here is is classically working in the frame of human rights. All right. So so it begs the question. Each of these rights has a value. But how do you begin to prioritize these rights? How do you begin to work them out in such a way that you say, well, there is a right to control property and, and own it, but there's also a right of a people to live. And when so many people are dying in the deserts, you know, how do you begin to sort of create policies that recognize the rights but prioritize them at the same time? So what this boils down to are three sets of political positions. Again, nationally and internationally, these positions whole. This group here is going to kind of emphasize enforcement. So control the borders, build a bigger wall, protect what we have, keep them out. This group here is saying, hey, they need the work, we need the workers, let's create a legal system to allow people to move back and forth. This group here is saying, if people are coming and they're going to work here, there should at least be the opportunity for an earned path to citizenship. Right? Now, the Catholic Church does not advocate for completely open borders, but it does say you can't simultaneously exploit people or get sort of the labor from them without giving them some subsequent recognition and belonging to a society. Now, <clears throat> the language of the debate, if, if the whole goal here is to get a new narrative about migration, the language of that narrative is what stitches together the story. And those of you who work in gender studies or feminist studies or linguistic studies know that language shapes a reality. Right? Language shapes a reality, and no more so than, than in this area. This group sees them as aliens. Right? That's the official terminology of the U.S. government, that they're considered aliens. Right? I, I have a colleague of mine who married somebody from Canada, and he was sharing with me one time. He says, you know, it was kind of a strange experience. He says, when I, when I married my wife, we went to an immigration hearing, and the officer looked at me and then looked at my wife and then looked at me again. And then he said, how long have you known the alien? <laughs> so he just said, it was just kind of a very bizarre sort of thing. My first book was uh, called Border of Death, Valley of Life. It's, at Life. it's on spirituality of immigrants. And I often thought, I was kind of touring with different titles, and I thought maybe I would call it Alien Spirituality. And I thought, you know, I don't know, maybe go out on a limb. Maybe I just ask Sigourney Weaver if she could do the introduction to it. So, but the, really, the whole sentence, and these are really just being debated in the courts. and saying, so if a person comes across a border without documents, what kind of rights do they have? Are they rights given by God that no government can take away? 
or are they rights that have to be secured and granted by, by a country without which there's no legal recognition? Right? That's a hard one. And, and I think some people really want to take that in both directions. Certainly the church is going to say they're human and those rights should be protected regardless whether they have official documentation or not. But some people don't, even people who are Catholics or Christians. This group sees them as workers. And so it's really a labor equation. And it's saying, is this an economic gain or drain on the economy? And, and so the economists that have really seriously studied this, and the rhetoric this has to be distinguished from the rhetoric as well, because the rhetoric say they're taking our jobs, they're drained on our resources, and you can skew it any way you want. All right? But the fact is they're doing jobs that no one else wants. They're actually paying taxes into a system, often not getting anything back from it. And they're consumers as well. All right? So the most honest decision is about at parity. It's about whatever arguments made or for or against. It's sort of, it's really kind of seen both ways. But here the equation is definitely looked at. It says, is this good for the economy or bad for the economy? Now, the bishops really reverse this entirely. And they say, look, it's not whether or not it's good for the economy or not. The economy is made for human beings, not human beings for the economy. So really, in the end of the day, what they're trying to do, and I think at the heart of a theology of migration, is to see these are people. They're human beings. And my sense is if you don't, re if you don't get the human face of the migrant right, then nothing else is going to fall together. And if you say, well, they're dying in desert because it's their fault because they shouldn't have come, well, that's a very different equation than if you say these are human beings made in the image and likeness of God because that makes a very different set of, of moral demands on us. So trying to get the human face of the migrant right is probably one of the most difficult issues to do but the most fundamental. If we can't see the humanity of the migrant, we can't see in that humanity the image of God, if we can't see in that humanity an image of ourselves, then we really can't advance very far in this, in this, in this issue. But now... When we get to the legal issue, this is where it breaks down. And, and so certainly in the United States, where we deal with a high degree of undocumented population, I often hear people say, and even very educated people, right, who will say to me, and sometimes with various levels of aggressiveness, they will say something to the tune of, look, Father, I have no problem with immigrants. Just the fact that they came here illegally. So which part of illegal don't you understand? Right. Now, my good friend Don Kerwin, you know, has a response to that. And, you know, he, said, he says, you know, sometimes you just want to react and say, well, you know, which part of the gospel don't you, don't you understand? Uh, but that's kind of aggressive, too. So um, it's, uh, I think maybe we have to, to look at this a little more um, amp, uh, an ample frame. And the problem is, is that, that the civil law is only one dimension of law. And if we only look at civil law, we really don't understand law or we don't understand reality. Now, Thomas Aquinas looked at it this way. He says actually four kinds of laws. There's natural laws. In this case, parents need to feed their families. There's civil laws, which societies use to organize themselves to the common good. There are divine laws, which we know through scripture, about feeding the hungry and the thirsty and the naked and the sick and the imprisoned and the estranged. And there are eternal laws through which God keeps the universe in motion. So the goal of justice is to find some sort of connection between these laws. So there's some sort of coherence among them that one participates in the other. But when you have civil laws that are at variance with with natural laws and divine laws, and Martin Luther King pointed this out from a Birmingham jail, when he says, when we have laws that segregate and divide and discriminate, that in some sense it's a violence against the natural order of things and the way God has intended creation to be. So, but the debate goes like this. This group here is going to emphasize civil laws. In my country, certainly the way it goes is this. What are you, crazy? I mean, those people are going to take our jobs. They're going to ruin our culture. They're going to make us eat salsa all the time. You know? <laughs> you know, it's sort of some offense to reason. You know, like rational people don't allow those people in here, right? So, you know, <laughs> Patrick Buchanan, fellow Catholic, I, I actually thank him so much for this comment because with a straight face, one time he was on a talk show and he says, the problem with immigrants today, and these were his exact words, is that they're taking away Native American culture. <laughs> It's a great line, all right? So as Native American European culture has taken on, you know, its primacy, but as it's really receding to sort of larger numbers from other groups, this creates a sense of threat and invasion. 
This group here, however, is going to really emphasize the economic laws. And so here it's classically the notion of Adam Smith and the invisible hand. And this sense of saying that, look, let's let the economy work this out. All right? We've seen wonderful examples of what happens when we do that. Um, Larry Rasmussen has a line when he says, you know, he says, Adam Smith had no conception of a capitalist society when he wrote his work. He said he had in mind a capitalist economy that was held together by non-capitalist moral sentiments. But as globalization uproots some of the traditional moorings of society, many of which have been bound together by religion, that we do have a tendency to move from monotheism to money theism. And so the idol of church choice is capital. And so keep in mind that the scriptures remind us that the real temptation in the scriptures throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's not atheism. It's not not believing in God. It's idolatry. And so underneath all this are the questions are what are the idols of choice today you know, that cause such dehumanizing consequences? How do we know if we're worshiping the true God? Well, People are liberated. People are free. People are connected. Right relationships happen. How do we know that's not happening? It's just the opposite. People are exploited. People are dehumanized. People are enslaved. And so we have to ask, what are the operative ideologies and idolatries really that keep people from being whole and being free? This group here uh, really emphasizes much more the natural laws, or and this is a term from the United Nations, about the invisible heart. Very interesting to see you know, a group like the United Nations ask the question, really, what are we all about anyways? I mean, you know, is it just about sort of making money or kind of getting stuff, or is it about trying to find out what it means to be human together? And so that requires a bit more than rational thought. It requires sort of a caring community that allows us to find some ways of connecting to each other in more holistic ways. So underneath this, let me just summarize this part in two ways. Right? So, but really the central question is this. The central question is who is the other? Right? And we know in moral philosophy this stuff has been really asked in different ways. But really, how do we understand otherness? This group here sees that, calculates it in terms of a fear of the other. This group here calculates it in terms of the usefulness of the other. This group here sees it in terms of the connectedness to the other. And I think that's an important um, sort of kind of examination of conscience is to say, really, where am I with otherness? And it's not easy to go through otherness. Um, that my good friend Virgil Elisondo has said, you know, we're not just a melting pot, um, really, as of cultures. We're much more of a stew pot, you know. And things have to boil a bit, and they get tense at times, you know. But there is a sharing of, of ingredients and, and properties that really make us all better and more than we are in and of ourselves. So what we're left with are, are not just geographical borders. I think what we're left with are also conceptual borders uh, that cause a lot of these tensions, tension zones. And the first tension is a tension between sovereign rights and human rights. So it's the right of a nation to protect its borders. But it's also the right of people to a dignified life and even to migrate if necessary. Secondly, it's a tension between civil law and natural law. That is the right of a nation to organize a system of regulations for the common good but also the right of people to provide for their families, to feed, to educate, and to shelter them. Thirdly, it's a tension between national security and human insecurity. Uh, I really, I don't think we can ever have truly national security unless we deal with issues of human insecurity. Um, but w there are issues that need to be dealt with in terms of terrorism and protecting people from harm and violence. But there also is the right of people to protect their families from undue need, hunger, and excessive poverty and vulnerability. But lastly, there's a tension between citizenship and discipleship. And that is the challenge of a people to of a nation to fulfill the duties and expectations of being a member of the state. And here I'm going to begin to go a little deeper on this and say, but the challenge of discipleship of those who profess faith in Christ is to respond to the inclusive demands of the gospel, which means building connections across borders and finding ways of interlinking that go beyond just merely our national identities. Right? So there's something important about who I am as a Canadian or an American, but it's not the last word of who I am, and it's not the deepest word of who I am. That's something of what our faith tells us is that there's something much more profound and there's a much more deeper river to us than just really what flag I wave or what nationality I really identify with. So 
this third part here is to really then move into the terrain of theology and spirituality. It's to do an interpretation of what we have just seen and to really ask ourselves, really, how do we think about God in Christ from this perspective? All right now, just um, one piece that, you know, uh, one narrative here I'd just like to introduce of something that happened to me uh, when I was about eight years old. I was driving across the East Coast with my family. We were on our way to see some relatives. And we stopped at a rest area. And when I went inside, there was a pamphlet on the ground that had a very provocative title that I never forgot. It said, did you know that you could actually miss heaven by 18 inches? And I opened it up, and I have to admit the theology really was pretty bad on the inside, but it had, a, it had something that I never forgot, because it said that the distance between the head and the heart in most people is 18 inches. And God was not just an idea to apprehend, but a relationship to enter into in the depths of one's being. Now, I would maintain that the journey between the head and the heart um, is really the most important migration we're ever going to make. And that the Native Americans took this further and they said the long journey of human life, I'd even say this way, the long migration of human life, is the journey between the head and the heart and then back to the head again. And I would maintain that the walls and the barriers and the obstacles along that road are more difficult than any along those of nation states. And so really what we're talking about as we begin to migrate downward, is we're moving into a vulnerable territory, but we're also dealing with the stuff that's most important to us. So really, in the end, spirituality has to do with how we live out what we most value. So it doesn't matter whether it's a Muslim spirituality or a Catholic spirituality or a Buddhist or even a secular spirituality. Something of spirituality, very much in vogue, is trying to find out what's most important to us, what matters in our hearts, what's most, what's most important to us. But Christian spirituality is something more specific, and that is how we live out what Christ most values. Right? So, and what did Christ most value? I mean, the, the, the heart, the soul, everything that is preaching, is teaching, is miracles, really was about the proclamation of one thing, that, that Christ really proclaimed the kingdom of God. That was his main message. He didn't just come to build a church. He came to proclaim the kingdom. You know, and the church had a role in proclaiming that kingdom, but the church was not the kingdom. The church actually pointed the way to the kingdom and created a community of people who really are journeying towards that kingdom. But it's really all about that kingdom, which Vatican II says is a church, is, is a kingdom of truth and life, of holiness and grace, of justice, of love, and of peace. So what, what, uh, another way of saying this, then, is that, that really... Jesus called people to migrate. Jesus called people to discipleship. And he called them to be a pilgrim people. He called them into being, called them to be a pilgrim people. Right? And this is a very, very important category because we know the migrants have ret refugees that we work with. I know I've seen this happen many times. That many coming, come into Mexico and they say, they leave Mexico thinking, you know, I'll go up to the United States, I'll work for a couple years, I'll get enough money so I can start a business back at home. So every time in the United States, you're like, if only I were in Mexico, if only I were in Mexico. They don't have the same morals, they don't appreciate it, the culture's not the same, food's very bland. You know, they keep going on and on, if only, if only, if only, if only, if only. And then you spend your whole life thinking about if only I were back there in my home, and then you get back there and you find out it's not the same home anymore. You don't belong the same way that you did. You've changed, they've changed, everything has changed. And so there's a sadness about that because inside you realize that no place is home in any final way. We have no place to lay our heads in an ultimate way. And, and yet in the midst of that crisis, it's also a moment to say, but then that maybe means that this is just a way station in this world and we are in a process of moving towards a greater homeland that we will realize one day. So there's a loneliness in that. But at the same time, it names the truth of who we are as human beings. Now, in, in this last section, this is the third and fourth section here, um, I want to frame this according to a narrative that, um, that happened to me one time when I was on the borders of uh, Morocco and Spain. There were two small Spanish colonies in Spain and uh, I mean, on the Moroccan coast, so the North African coast, two very small areas. And if you put an 18-foot wall around Waterloo, you might have you know, a sense of its dimension. So it's not very big, but um, they are two 
territories owned by Spain on the North African coast. And refugees stream up to this area because if they can get into that section and, and, and really declare asylum or, or really ask for, for asylum, then they don't have to swim across these waters of the Gibraltar Straits where thousands of people drowned. Right now, I know people have told me of stories how they've picked up people who are still alive swimming across these waters and they have their eyes all eaten out from some of the fish or, you know, um, you know things that have attacked them along the way. Many people drown. They're eaten by sharks. And they go through many, many um, incredibly agonizing deaths coming across this area. But if you can declare asylum without having to cross those waters, it's better. So I went up into the mountains there of this area and I uh, wanted to talk to migrants to hear something about the inter intermigration. And so eventually I really kind of spent a couple days with three refugees. Um, one had come from Uganda, one had come from Sudan, and the other ones had come from Somalia. Refugees like them take eight months to eight years to get up to that area. They say they cross two deserts, one of sand and the other of water and it's a harrowing trek and they talked about the pain and dangers of leaving home and the agony of leaving their families behind. They talked about hiding out in the mountains and having to eat dogs in order to survive or eating plants in order to just uh, move on. They talked about take, going through, uh, taking a whole year and taking only one shower. Um, they talked about many human rights violations they experienced and one of them talked about how when he was walking across the Sahara Desert with his sister, the temperatures were so extreme that she started splitting, spitting up blood and she ended up dying right in his hands. Right. And they told many such stories for three days. And then after three days, the table turned a bit and then they looked at me and they said, uh, so what do you do? Right. Now, they knew I was a priest, but uh, they said, do you work at a parish? And I said, well, primarily I'm working at a university. And they said, well, what do you do there? And with each question, I began to get a little more nervous um, because actually I knew what was at stake. Now, that whole year prior to that, I had been uh, studying in Oxford. I was on a sabbatical in Oxford, and I was trying to work with scholars and what I had learned on the grassroots to try to make some sort of a connection between these two. And, and I've often said that that the people in migrant camps didn't know, didn't care that I know, they just want to know that I cared. Whereas the people in the academy didn't care that I cared, they just cared that I know. Um, and so really kind of working between these, this kind of borderlands was, was not easy. But what I knew that was at stake, this was probably my most important jury on anything I had thought about in theology of migration because I knew that these people had the authority of those who suffered. And I knew that they were the ones who could either say, this is liberating, or this doesn't make any sense, and it's just garbledy gook. And so, Emmanuel, when I actually end up saying, well, actually, I teach things on, uh, in theology, and I actually uh, teach stuff, I said kind of, this is a shaky voice on theology and migration, that Emmanuel looked at me, one of them, who's from Uganda, he looked at me and he says, uh, he says, theology and migration, he says, well, you know, some people say the reason why we're suffering so much here in Africa is because we're descendants of Judas. And because of what Judas did to Jesus, we're paying the consequences. He said, what do you think about that? Now, that was a theological statement. Right? It was bad theology, but it was a theological statement nonetheless. So, I said, Emmanuel, here's another way to think about this. Right? And so, if you're asleep right now, wake up for one minute. Um, because this is the most important thing I'm going to say all night, all right? This is the most important thing. And I said, I said, Emmanuel, look at it this way. God in Jesus Christ so loved the world that he migrated into the far and distant territory of our sinful and broken existence. And there he laid down his life on a cross so that we could be reconciled to God and migrate back to our homeland. And what we see God doing in Jesus is constantly overcoming, breaking down, destroying those things that divide us so that we can be in right relationship. And so we see this happening in many, many different ways. And so as I began to say, what does the Christian tradition say about what's going on with migrants today in light of their stories? And really, how can the stories of migrants give us another way of reading, reading that tradition? And one of the things that I heard, one of the common denominators was really coming back to one fundamental thing. I realized that the migrants were saying, in the end of the day, we're not just refugees. We're not just political. We're not just uh, victims of human trafficking. We're not just internally displaced people. We're, we're not just um, economic migrants. We are human beings 
who really are made in the image and likeness of God. And so they're really, many of them are saying that we really are trying to overcome this inhuman human divide. One migrant put it this way. He said, you know, I've, cr I've um, crossed the deserts and almost baked to death. He says, I've gone up into the mountains when it's been snowing and almost frozen to death. He says, I've stowed away in baggage compartments of buses. He says, I've gone days without food and without water. He says, that stuff is extremely difficult. He says, but that's not the worst part about being a migrant. He said, the worst part about being a migrant is when people treat you like you're a dog, like you're the lowest form of life on earth, like you're no one to anyone. And it's that dehumanized sort of experience, you know, that really stings the deepest. And so crossing this inhuman-human divide is something that's so important um, because it really is at the core of the journey. And so one of the things we did is, is, was to, to, uh, to put together a number of films to try to bring out more the human face of the migrant as well as the face of Christ of the migrant. So I'm going to show you a very brief clip here from one of our films called Dying to Live, which talks a bit about that journey. For some migrants, the road north starts deep in Central America. Their first destination is the southern border of Mexico. From there, they make their way up to one of the towns near the border with the United States. These small towns have become staging areas for migrants as they prepare for their trek into the U.S. to link up with either family members or employers. The journey is dangerous. Bandits, loan sharks, and corrupt police prey on them. And then, there are the physical dangers. Many migrants travel north by freight train. And when they jump on trains, sometimes they'll stow away in a box car. Sometimes they'll hide themselves in between the train cars. It's very dangerous for 15, 16, 17 hours at a time, just holding on to a train, holding on for their dear life. A lot of immigrants sometimes, just because of sheer exhaustion, sometimes fall off the train. They'll lose a foot, they'll lose a leg, they'll lose an arm. A lot of them will, will fall off and never be die. In an award-winning photo series, LA Times photographer Don Bartletti rode the rails north through Mexico with the migrants. He photographed moments of fear, joy, adventure, and compassion. In Veracruz, there are people who live on the trackside who throw food at the migrants riding atop the freight train. There was one small little uh, mom and pop grocery store next to the tracks in Orizaba where a, a teenage boy had taken the leftover fruit from the market. And I thought um, uh, that this boy was going to toss the oranges and they would catch them like playing baseball. But at the last second he lunged towards the freight car with these guys and their arms hanging out. But through my viewfinder all I saw was the blurred motion of the train going by. I didn't see the most magic picture of my trip. Two hands touching, the migrants and the gift givers. Just a brief, brief brush, as if they were each communicating without words, saying, please go with God, go with peace, go with luck. And the migrant on the northbound freight train saying, thank you for this gift of food. The life of the migrant is a lonely experience. Will I fall off the train? Will I be robbed or swindled? What will happen at the border? These are just a few of the questions these men think about. There's, there's one very special photograph in, in my series, Bound to El Norte. It, it's a picture of Santo Antonio Game holding on to the sides on the end of a rail car. I was laying on top of the adjoining boxcar, looking straight down. He took one picture, and then he opened his mouth. The emotion came directly through the camera, into my heart, into my soul. And Santo told me, I'm going to Canada, where I have a job as a, uh, as a painter. And I said, well, what were you thinking when you were holding onto the train car? And I was yelling at him, because it's still noisy. He says, I was praying to my Savior. Let me pass this time. So 
So this image here, um, really, I think, is emblematic. It's really probably most the, the, the most significant interpretive move here of uh, understanding the migrant's journey as a way of the cross as a political crucifixion, as a social crucifixion, as a legal crucifixion, uh, sometimes it's an actual crucifixion where people die. Uh, you know, there's a Jesuit in El Salvador you know, who's killed, Ignacio Ayurquiria, you may know know some of his work, but uh, he said that, that, that the crucified peoples of today are the sign, the sign of the times from which we need to read every other sign. So he says, put yourself at the bottom read reality from the perspective of the crucified and he says then you'll see things correctly you know and I think that's a very very important image you know so who are those crucified today because of unjust structures because of really uh, you know um, poor working conditions uh, unfair wages and many other many other things and I think this to me is is very much emblematic of part of what migrants go through but here's a very important piece is that those who are crucified today are not just those for whom we must feel sorry and move to give charitable contributions to um, out of the goodness of our hearts. That's true, but it's not the whole of it. Is that, is that also what I want to posit here is that the question of not only how are the crucified peoples today calling us to a greater sense of connection, but also how are they key to a nation's redemption? So not just do it, how do we help the poor, but also how do the poor, in this case, really bring a saving reality to us that can be rejected. So the, the next um, kind of th uh, foundation of a theology of migration is the verbum day or the word of God, which is crossing over the divine human divide. And here is something very significant, is that, that God didn't kind of come to us when we got our act together. Um, that God's love was so great for us that it was always bigger than the walls and barriers that we set up because of sin. So if we see the incarnation as the fundamental migration, then we really see how God's love and gratuity is what defines everything else. Right? So this is not just about arguments of humanitarianism. This is actually a theological argument that, that really is saying that it's God's graciousness and gratuity which undergirds everything else. Any commitments to justice, to poverty, to alleviation of that begins first with God's love for us in our poverty. And it's about crossing over the divine human divide. So this is what we see God doing. And so it's interesting that in Matthew's Gospel, that the, it begins, the, the whole story of Jesus' life begins amidst a drama of documentation. And that in very short order, his family is thrust into Egypt as political refugees. So God not only becomes human, which is an incredible migration to contemplate in and of itself, but God also enters into the solidarity of those who are most vulnerable, those who are in Egypt. Now, recently, uh, this is my, my thinking's developed on this. I was listening to some evangelicals recently, and actually, you know, a group of evangelicals who I happen to respect very much, and they had had a guest speaker on their program who had been working on, you know, the church and migration, and so he, he just simply was saying, you know, we know that Jesus and Mary and Joseph went into Egypt. We know that they did. We don't know if they went in legally or not. Right now, this evangelical pastor was very, very, very nervous about this, and he just wanting to kind of, you know, hold to, you know, the righteousness legitimately of the Holy Family. He said, he says, I'm going to maintain that they went across that border legally. <laughs> right now, I'm going to actually say something very different. I'm going to say I know for a fact that Jesus was illegal. I know that. All right now, how do I know that? Well. When God migrated into Mary's womb in the Annunciation, right, Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Now to impregnate another man's wife right, during their betrothal, according to Jewish law, would not only be fundamentally illegal, but it would make God subject to the punishment of stoning. Now, that is a point of contemplation, right? God could have come at another time. He could have come prior to the betrothal. He could have come, and Joseph could have bailed him out. Uh, he could have come after they were married. But he came when Mary was legally betrothed to Joseph, which makes Jesus illegal from the start. Now, that doesn't dispense of the need for the law or the importance of the law or the centrality of the law in our religious traditions. 
But it does point out our temptation and tendency to absolutize it, to misappropriate, and to misunderstand it completely. And we know even another point, Jesus died on a cross, which anyone who does so according to the Levitical law really was cursed. So think about God so breaking open the bounds of gratuity that he enters into solidarity with all those who are considered outside of the law, all those who are illegal. But this is really what God is doing. He's saying there is a divide here because of sin and that, that God's love is so great that it even overcomes that divide because that's who God is. The third foundation is the missio dei or the mission of God which is about crossing over the human, human divide. And so what Jesus did in proclaiming the kingdom, my good friend Virgil Elizondo says, he says, really, when God proclaimed the kingdom of God, he welcomed everybody to table, because the table is the great sign of that kingdom. So in proclaiming the kingdom and proclaiming that gratuity, he invites everybody to table, whether they're righteous or unrighteous, whether they're sinners or tax collectors or prostitutes, he invited everybody. What Elizondo says is that in inviting everybody, he rejected rejection. But because there were some people at that table, for legal reasons, completely dismissed Jesus, they rejected him. They rejected Jesus. So as Elisondo says, the reject, who rejected rejection, however, is also the one who rises from the dead, which vindicates Jesus' way as the way. So the mission of the church is to continue the mission of Jesus, which is to invite people to that table fellowship. That's the sign of the kingdom. That's the sign the kingdom is here. Right. And that's what this do is that the job in a church is breaking down those divides which we construct socially, racially, religiously, culturally, and, and interpersonally that really keep us from being connected to each other. Right. Also, we have the Visio Dei, which is the vision of God, which is crossing over the country-kingdom divide. All right. Now, if, if my vision of life is this is my stuff, I need to protect it. I've worked hard for it, and it's mine. That comes out of a theology. That comes out of a spirituality. It's very different than everything I have is a gift. Everything I have is something that God has given me, including my talents. And then at the end of the day, I have to give it back, and I will be judged by how I use it. That's a different way to root oneself in the world. And it's rooted in a vision of God, which is a community of such total giving of one of three persons to the other and such total receiving to the other that you, they actually become one. It's a community of just boundless giving and boundless receiving because it's not just about giving, it is also about receiving and relationship. And when they do, they become one. And somehow that the human community has a corollary in that in trying to approximate that same kind of union. And when we put walls and barriers uh, up in such a way that we can't even connect across borders, we become less human ourselves. And even though our national identities have some proximate value in terms of who we are, and I must admit that when the Olympics came, I checked that medal count every day, all right? And sometimes I didn't know if I wanted to see China lose or America win, all right? I'll put it out there. But I really wanted to make sure the American medal count was on the rise, all right? But in the end of the day, that's not the most important thing. It's not really what defines me at the end of the day. The bragging rights don't really get me anywhere anyways. That what really matters is how are we doing as a human community? And that's the vision, I think, of which that God holds out for us, of trying to see beyond our national borders to see somehow the kingdom, which is much more and all-inclusive. So where that brings us to in conclusion is another way of understanding what the imitatio Dei is, which is crossing over the life-death divide. And as the former commissioner for the for United Nations Human Rights, used, uh, High Commissioner for Refugees used to say that if my brother or sister comes to me in need, in this case as a refugee, and I deprive them of their basic necessities, I not only really keep them from having what they need, but I also become less of a human being myself. I've somehow deported my soul in a way that I become less than what God has created me to be. And all of that are decisions of life and death, I think, for us, of how we really deal with this otherness and openness. And so, uh, in, in summary, really, if we are to really speak about uh, what it means to be an alien from a theological perspective, it has nothing to do with political documentation. 
person who really is alien in, in, in theologically speaking is really a person who's so disconnected from God, from their stranger in need, and even from themselves that they can't see that the true immigrant is a mirror of the human journey, a mirror of who we are in this world, vulnerable, crossing borders in need of help, unable to do it alone, searching for a prom promised land, and traveling in hope. But also a reflection of Christ. And if you really look at the situation of the migrants today crossing the Arizona deserts and other places in the American Southwest, that th theirs is typical, I think, of really what we even see in Matthew's Gospel. What's the final criteria that we have in the scriptures for judgment? It's what we did, we did for the least of our brothers and sisters. What's happening to migrants in the deserts there? They're hungry in their homelands. They're thirsty in the deserts they cross. They're naked after being robbed at gunpoint, even down to their own clothing. They're sick after having to drink even their own urine in order to survive. They're imprisoned in detention centers. And if they get anywhere here or Canada or the United States, they're often treated as strangers and being unwelcomed. But yet, how is Christ present there in a way that's not immediately obvious, but is no less real? And so what it leads us to is a challenge of human solidarity. Um, and there is a beautiful mass that they have each year down at the uh, U.S.-Mexican border where it's a binational mass where half the communities in Mexico and half the communities in the United States and they actually join the altar together at the fence. And so half the communities there. We have a video on this if you want. But it, it actually talks about what it means to be a body of Christ amidst this divided political reality. And in technical theological language, that is an eschatological statement. It is a sign of what we will become and are moving towards but it is also saying what we already now are in Christ. And so, really, a new imagination about this. In the United States, we have a Department of Homeland Security. But we need a new way of thinking about migration that's founded first on issues of development. The first ideal is that migrants don't have to migrate at all, that they can stay in their homeland. But for that to happen, the priority of it needs to and there's development that's needed. Secondly is hospitality. That really what transforms people and if we're honest with our own experiences, what makes us feel human is when we feel welcome and we have a place to belong. In the depths of the souls, even though migrants want jobs and they want really uh, to find a place to live, they also want to know that they have some place and purpose where they come to. And lastly, it's uh, looking for a place of solidarity. It's recognizing that we could become the migrants or refugees of Syria at any moment. Uh, we could become like the migrants looking for jobs anywhere. There is a movie a number of years ago called The Day After Tomorrow, which talks about a cataclysmic ice storm that hits this part of the country. Uh, and so the whole northern half of northern North America is, is kind of sent back into the ice age. And so people are fleeing for their lives and they actually have to go across the Mexican border. And when they do so, the Mexicans are saying, no, no, no no, we don't want you. They you know, come here legally. So that vulnerability is a shared vulnerability, and perhaps that's what the migrant does. It exposes our vulnerability, which we're just so afraid to, to even face. Well, I close just uh, at the end of this conversation with, with uh, Emmanuel and my friends up in Morocco, the Spanish colony in Ceuta, that you know, at the end of the conversation with them, you know, I put these thoughts out there, and I wasn't quite sure how they re would respond. And, I, and, um, and so... You know, but it was probably one of the most, the reactions of Emmanuel was probably one of the most important reactions or, that I've ever received uh, as a priest or as a theologian. Because what, one was what they didn't say. They didn't say, well, those are really good ideas. I hope you get those published in a peer-reviewed journal article somewhere. Um, um, what, the, what was really important here is that Emmanuel didn't even look at me at all. He just lifted his eyes up to heaven and he goes like this and he goes, Yay, God! He says, I can't believe you would do that for me. And then at that moment a light went on and I realized what I was doing and what I've been sharing with you here today. And it just is a participation in what Jesus says in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. He says, I've come to proclaim good news to the poor, sight to the blind, liberty to captives, and a year of favor from the Lord. So thank you for coming tonight. I think we have some time for some questions, hopefully. That was a lot of time. We do have some time. We'll take a little bit of time for questions. So there are two microphones at the side. 
Uh, if you, I'm just going to ask you to go to one of those microphones and I'm going to ask you to be concise and brief and so we can get in as many comments and questions as we can. And I'll let Daniel field the questions on his own. So, there's a lot of Latin American, Latin migration to the states. How do you see that actually changing the states? Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, Latin, Latino migration to the states. How's that actually changing the states? Well, it's changing on a number of different levels. I mean, certainly in, in the media and in commerce, you see a lot more people targeting Latinos in terms of knowing that they're consumers. In the churches, more than 50% of many of the dioceses are Latinos. Many of the people occupying leadership roles, I think, are Latinos. And certainly, I think we see a lot more um, lingui linguistic intermixing as well. And I, yeah, I think that, you know, for me, I know it best within the churches. I certainly see it happening within the culture. You certainly see everything from billboards to signs to even television stations. You see kind of much more of a bilingual country. And, but I think it, where, where I particularly see this was in the churches. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done with Latinos, I think, in terms of reaching out to them. But they are bringing a tremendous vitality to the, to the churches. Uh, a love of family. Not that they're the only ones, but a primacy of family that they bring. A dedicated work ethic. An ability to what they call a guante. Uh, really, uh, there's a long-suffering there that they really give testimony. A tremendous sense of devotions to Virgin of Guadalupe, to Jesus Nazareño, uh, to uh, traditional um, the Day of the Dead celebrations, to Posadas. I think all this stuff is transforming us for the good. And so I think it's the only way forward um, is to become something new. Again, quoting my friend Elisondo, he says, the future is mestizo. And, and I think we become better by the intermixing of cultures. His big challenge, Elisondo was, when he was growing up on the borderlands, he says, Am I Mexican? Am I American? Am I neither? Am I both? And what he comes to is he says that really what we become is a new synthesis. That we see this biological mestizaje happening all the time. But we also see this spiritual mestizaje happening as well. People are bringing religious traditions and devotions that are transforming Catholicism in America. So I think really Catholicism was much more white European Catholicism, but now I think we're seeing a much more one that's much more marked by Latino uh, pe people coming from Latino backgrounds, and and uh, I think that's making us all the stronger, frankly. Hi, in Canada, our situation is much different because there's no one particular culture coming, but rather many, many, many. Do you know someone doing similar work with that situation? Like, how do we cope when it isn't? a bicultural integration, but rather a multi-multicultural yeah. integration. And, and I wouldn't want to flatten it out too much. Even among the Latino cultures, the, the Cubans are very different from the Mexicans. They're very different from the Colombians. And so I would just say the biggest numbers are the the Latinos. And uh, actually 50%, 60% uh, are from Latin America. Another 30% are from other parts. 60% are from Mexico. 30. 50% are from Mexico, 30% are from other Latin American countries, and the 20% are the others. So for us, the non-Latinos are about 20% on that. And uh, But I do recognize here in Toronto that you have many people coming from many, many other different places. But California does too. There's a lot of Asians coming into California, as well as Latinos. And so that multiculturalism does present kind of many interreligious, intercultural, and uh, other challenges in that. Is anybody doing it well? I don't think so. I mean, I think it's a struggle. It's a birth process, as I mentioned earlier. When I was, my first parish, it was a Hungarian parish in an African-American neighborhood that was primarily Latinos, and we yoked with a Polish-American, uh, Polish church. The Polish arrived 20 minutes before Mass. The Hungarians arrived 10 minutes before Mass. The Hispanics arrived 10 minutes after Mass. <laughs> but after the final Mass, uh, after the final blessing, I could shut down the, uh, the Polish parish within two minutes after the final blessing. The Hungarian mass, it was 10 minutes, and, the, and 20 to 30 minutes after mass was over, the Latinos were still hanging around, right? Now, the homilies were very different in both, both places as well. One was over 75, 
you know, and the other one was under 25 primarily. Uh, the messages, the needs, the challenges of those groups constantly kept me recalibrating how you really do that. And I think that's part of what I hear within your question is understanding those questions. And, and I have to admit, going over to Africa to going into some of these refugee situations, I, I had, I mean, there was just so many coordinates that I just did not understand. There were so many levels of, of experiences and insight and, you know, I just really didn't have a clue. And, and so there's just a lot of profound listening that needs to happen. And I think, but I think the most important thing is to get to that bedrock and say, but yet every culture and every group is going to see that to be treated as a human being with respect and a value and importance and worth is the most important thing. And it's from that that we begin to kind of really share with each other in our differences. But really this is a multicultural society here and it is a big challenge. I believe you said there are more people displaced in China than in the rest of the world. Can you elaborate on that? You know, d d mostly people are moving from rural areas to urban areas in search of work. And, and so, you know, I'm relying on a lot of the research done by Stephen Castles, one of the foremost kind of uh, really anthropologist, sociologist, I think is uh, on, on issues of, of migration. And so, you know, that's what some of the numbers is. Of course, one out of every six people in the world, I think we, we put her from China, another, so, uh, th you know, 1.2 billion people. So if you displace a big portion of that from rural areas going to the major cities where a lot of the jobs are, we know that the major manufacturer of the world's goods today are coming from China. A lot of those people are coming from areas towards the major urban areas looking for work. So that's where that internal displacement is. It's not the same kind of political displacement that you would see or violent displacement that you would see going on in, uh, in South America and Colombia and other places, but it's still large, large numbers of people. Yeah, sometimes environmentally too. In the building of dams, people are also moving. Yeah. I don't have a I don't have a question. Uh, I have an observation. Uh, as a member of the faculty here at the university, um, I'm deeply moved by how you indicated uh, how that trip is made, those 18 inches, and that you've somehow been able to combine an enormous amount of information with preaching the gospel from the heart. So I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. That means a lot. Yeah. Thank you. I, too, want to say the same thing, not so eloquently, so thank you. <laughs> but uh, I, I know from some of the people that work with refugees, both in Toronto and in Kitchener, the horribleness of the political rulings that uh, make it difficult for people to stay unless they are economically stable to start with. So I'm just wondering what you can do with what we can do with your knowledge of trying to make our country more hospitable and more in solidarity with refugees that try to come here and uh, the recent rulings have made it even more difficult. I wish I had a, a magic insight into that one. I, I think it is the task of community to come together to ask, you know, what that means. I, I do know that, you know, as even CNN had done a study a number of years ago, or not, um, a couple of months ago, they did a documentary on you know, who's doing migration right, who's doing it wrong. Canada figured out much, much better than than, than many other countries. Um, but I know that some of the recent trends in the government have really been dialing back the time. I know certainly when I first started working with migrants, El Salvador and mi migrants in the 80s, uh, you know, Canada was really the great haven of welcome for a lot of people who were undergoing that kind of persecution. But what we're seeing is this pendulum swing again now. And so much more protective, much more guarded, much more safe, and much more kind of monochrome. Um, and, and so there's a lot of political capital that many po candidates think that they can gain by kind of the politics of fear. I think we have to call them out at that and, you know, really recognize that the politics of fear don't get us anywhere. And, and, and they don't often win. I, I don't have definitive studies on this, but I know some of the most vitriolic politicians who really tried to capitalize on the immigrant fear have not been elected, but some of them do. 
Some of them really do. And I think some of our job is to call them out on that. There's maybe I just point out what can we do? There's three areas that really I think are the most important education, advocacy, and direct service. And I think all of us are going to be contributing to that in different ways. And so part of it is is to see where where are we placed and how can we make a contribution with it is. For some that's gonna be that direct service and helping people whatever skills we have or whatever outreach we can do. But other people are gonna be working in the academy and maybe connected to the grassroots but maybe sort of want to help shape people's minds and thoughts about this. Um, but there are other people on a structural level uh, that, that you know I know right now we're trying to do initiatives that are, uh, are trying to promote what's called our Dream Act, which you know there are people who might be in this country, might have come here when they were one or two years old, but they can't go to college because you know they're they're illegal still. Um, and so we've been trying to put a lot of efforts in the, into this, but I'm working very, very closely with Cardinal Mahoney on this, uh, uh, retired Archbishop Cardinal of uh, Los Angeles. But he, you know his words, he, he says, that really I don't have much faith in in really the, the political leaders at this point, and I don't either. You know, there's not a lot of hope right there in change in Washington. So we're actually putting our emphasis on the Catholic colleges and campuses, trying to really generate momentum there. Some of what the what the, what the leaders were asking presidents of these universities to really look very carefully at what they can do to welcome those who are in need, to really see that's part of the Catholic heritage at universities, but also you know to to, um, to really uh, to get students involved in such a way that they're generating momentum on this. So I, I wish I knew the right answers uh, on this, but I, I think it's one we continually struggle with. I'm interested in knowing uh, your thoughts on our responsibility in the global north for, well, according to natural law and divine law, our responsibility for pushing and pulling people out of place. So making migrants, making refugees. Um, this is, it's not by accident that migration patterns follow certain routes. Um, and we, are, we live daily the benefits of cheap labor uh, and, and so on, and, and the inequalities over the world. So I just, I'm, it strikes me that there's a need for more than hospitality. <laughs> um, th somehow there's a need for uh, repentance and changing our ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that's well said. And I think in, at its heart, it's really a search for justice. And and I think that justice does require a rethinking, not just, you know, that, that rethinking also can work us into a new way of feeling and a new way of acting, you know, on that. So I, I think this is just a first statement. I don't think it actually is in any way a definitive last word because there are so many, it, it, I really think what we're talking about here is the issues of conversion. You know, in the end of the day, it's conversion. But it's conversion to the fundamental questions of life and the fundamental issues of life, you know, which is really about other people. You know, it is about trying to find a way uh, of connecting. Because, I don't know, the older I get, it just seems to me that it is all about connectedness. I think the older I get, I realize uh, I can't do what I do alone. I can't, I, 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 in some sense, no matter how much I, I even move around, it's just, you know, that I know I'm part of a larger web of life. And, you know, I think we're, there's no way we can get around that. And I think our sacramental expressions of this only really bring out what is most authentically true in our human nature, which is that we have to find ways of building these relationships. And that's the fundamental, evalu that's the fundamental criteria of evaluating whether or not we're progressing as a nation, is what's the quality of our relationships. So it's not in terms of GNPs, it's not about an economic variable. It does have a value, but they're not the most important. What's the quality, what are the human costs? What's the human quality relationships? Um, this may be a little bit off topic from the main point of your talk, but you did mention that there were two islands, Tuvalu and one other, that um, are going underwater <coughs> and where um, essentially uh, the residents are all having to become ma migrants because of environmental... Stateless, yes, yeah, stateless people. Yeah. So, um, I'm wondering what has the response been to that? Is it just, well, poor islanders, I guess you're on your own, or has there been some kind of international response? Because I can see 
um, that environmental refugees is the, the term that's been used is going to become more exactly. of a factor, right? And so right. I don't know what the current response has been. The environmental refugees will become even greater, and that's that's really the point is to highlight the issue of the environmental refugees. What's happening is people, many of them have been resettled into Australia and to New Zealand, but they haven't taken all of them, But and that's where the struggle is. You know, they've said, look, we can't take everybody. Australian is saying, you know, that, that uh, you know, we shouldn't have to burden share all of this. But uh, I guess what I wanted to point out is saying that uh, even though there has been a lot of efforts at resettlement, there's still been a lot of struggle in that resettlement and that we are still dealing with very small numbers comparatively to what will happen if environmental refugees become even more of an issue. If, if kind of uh, sources of water dry up, if uh, sources of water actually flood other areas, people will be moving. And, and there could be other things that precipitate it as well. But war is one area that's traditionally been one of human rights violations, unstable governments, um, but the environment's a big wild card. Thank you. I'm going to have you, because I'm going to invite up Dr. Jim Frank, our Vice President and Academic Dean, to formally thank Dr. Dr. Gurdy on our behalf. Dan, you were you were the, the perfect choice to launch our 2012-2013 lectures in Catholic experience, and I I thank Christina for getting you at the front of the line up here. Um, your your message uh, had so much in it. Just the challenge of moving from citizenship, good citizenship, to discipleship is a big step, and, and one we all have to take to really insert ourselves into this, this problem. From there, you know, I don't think I can thank you any better than uh, my colleague at the back did a moment ago, Dr. Neufeld, is he still here? Um, oh, you've moved over. <laughs> thank you, that, that was so eloquently said. Uh, I, I think that is the, the perfect thank you, so thank you. So I want to thank all of you as well for attending the lecture, but for your attention to Daniel's presentations. Very, I can, you can feel the thoughtfulness and your attentiveness, so thank you for that. And I want to thank the Loretto sisters for endowing the Teresa Deese Lecture Fund so that we can bring people like Daniel here. A couple of housekeeping things before you leave. You can sign up in the foyer if you are not on our mailing list or email list and you want to make sure to get updates and information, then there's a, a place for you to sign up before you leave. We are able to present these lectures to you and bring all kinds of provocative speakers to our community be at no charge to you because of your generosity and support. So if you would like to support these lectures at all, there are some envelopes on the chairs for uh, here or out in the foyer and there's a basket to collect those. And I want to say thank you so much. It helps uh, us be able to do this service when people donate. And then I want to let you know that the next lecture is taking place on Friday, October 26th. We are bringing Dr. Kristen Henrard here and she will be giving this year's Devlin Lecture. Dr. Henrard is a professor of minority protection and she's an associate professor of constitutional law at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Now luckily for us, she's doing a sabbatical in Montreal so we can get her here a little bit more easily. She's published in the areas of human rights, minority protection, including educational rights, linguistic rights, the freedom of religion, and the accommodation of religious diversity. She's going to be coming and speaking to us about the new challenges that we are facing these days about human rights and church-state relations. So thank you so much again for coming and your attention. And I hope that you and your families have a wonderful Thanksgiving harvest celebration this, this weekend. Have a safe trip home. I hope to see you on October 26th. Until next time, good night. Thank you.